Good morning and welcome on to this first Sunday in Lent on this February 21st, 2021. Here is this morning's gospel and sermon, but first let us pray. Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood, you saved the chosen in the wilderness of temptation. You protected your son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I get to the gospel, I want to touch a little on Genesis 9, chapters 8 through 17. And that is Genesis 9, chapters 8 to 17, which was our first reading this morning, but... Uh, I did. I didn't read it. So, if you want to turn to your Bible, double check that I'm right. Yeah, you're feel well. Feel free to do that. The Old Testament reading is all about promises. When Noah stepped out of the ark, God gave him a reassuring promise or a covenant, if you will. This covenant had three parts. One, never again will a flood do such destruction. Number two, as long as the earth remains, the seasons will always come as expected. And three, a rainbow will be visible when it rains as a sign to all that God will keep his promises. The promises hold true. The earth's order and seasons are still preserved and rainbows still remind us of God's faithfulness to his word. Now get into this morning's gospel. Every person has some big events in life. And for me, it was the birth of my nephews and niece, my great great nephews and nieces. I'm kind of looking forward to the time I will be selling, have be having some great great nephews and nieces, and of course, my kids Spencer and Sheridan. I better not leave them out. Graduation for me was big as well. High school graduation, getting my bachelor's in physical education and getting my master's in counseling in college, which I will say, I'm surprised I got out of college, alive, in obtaining my PMA certification. Marriage to my lovely bride, Shelly, was pretty awesome too. I better not leave her out. And finally, death, losing both my parents and grandparents. And a couple years ago, my father-in-law, uh, those were all big events. But I truly believe, I truly believe this, that the most important event for anyone is to becoming a Christian. And why is that? Being a Christian affects you and others for eternity. Now think about it. My college degree is pretty cool. I'm doing something that I enjoy. I love teaching. I love, I love physical education. I love teaching that. My family is awesome. Hopefully they feel the same way about their dear old dad. But that's not forever. But I guess if you think about it, it kind of is because when we die, we'll go up and we'll meet our family. But eternity is. Eternity is forever. Now, unfortunately, many people who become Christians do not really appreciate it until later in life. You may even hear people say this, that they'll work on being a really good Christian, like maybe volunteering when they're retired. Sometimes I fall myself in that trap. 
To me, this morning's message is presented in three parts. The baptism of Jesus, Jesus being tempted for 40 days, and finally, the preaching ministry of Jesus. Verses 9 through 11 talks about the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And this came at the height of John the Baptist's ministry, which after soon it began, it declined. It also served as the beginning of Jesus' ministry, which soon overtook the ministry of John. So, what do we know about the baptism of Jesus? According to scripture, we know that Jesus came from Nazareth. Nazareth was about a hundred mile journey to where John was baptizing. We know that, Je that Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River. The baptism involved a method of immersion. And here's something to note. Peter in the second reading says that Noah's salvation through water symbolized baptism. It's not that the ceremony that saves us. Instead, the ceremony involving water. The ceremony is evidence of our faith in Christ's death and resurrection. Now, I've often wondered why Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. Get this now. The Jordan River is a 156-mile-long river that is between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. And the sea has no outlet. Two major tributaries enter from the east, the Yermak River and the, Zar and the Zarkal River. So that's your geography lesson for the day, if you will. I was actually a, geog a geography teacher, a junior high geography teacher in my early years of teaching. I was talking to a person who is a lay minister in another church, and she likes to give a little history. I need to step up my game, I think, huh? But why the Jordan River and not the Sea of Galilee? Or the Dead Sea? Or are the other rivers flowing into the Jordan River? Jordan, the Jordan River represents a perfect mikvah of continuously running water. You're probably thinking, a mikvah? That's not part of your normal conversation, Stan. But a mikvah in modern translation looks like a miniature swimming pool. It's humble. It's a humble structure which gives the nation of Israel purity and holiness. The Jordan River is considered the third most holy site in the Holy Land, just after the Nativity Grotto in Bethlehem and Golgotha in Jerusalem, because it's the site of the most important event in Jesus' life, his, baptizing, his baptism and the beginning of his ministry. So, that's your history for one day. Now, we know in verse 10, the Spirit descends on Jesus immediately as he comes up from the water. The Holy Spirit bears his testimony of Jesus. And finally, in verse 10, the Father speaks of Jesus, proclaiming, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I've often wondered why Jesus was baptized. We know that Jesus did not need baptism because he was without sin. Jesus was about to embark on his great work, so it was appropriate that he be recognized publicly by his forerunner John. Matthew 3 verse 11 says this, But someone is coming soon who is far greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to be a slave. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus' baptism also showed that he identified with sinners and symbolized the sinner's baptism into righteousness of Christ, dying with him and rising free from sin and able to walk in the newness of life. Finally, perhaps he was baptized because Jesus was showing his approval of his baptism that it was from heaven and approved from God. The second part of this morning's gospel talks about the temptation of Jesus. Verses 12 to 13 says, Immediately the Holy Spirit compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness and was there for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Now the number 40 is a significant factor in this morning's gospel. According to what I read, Jesus' 40 days of temptation reminds us of the 40 years the Israelites wandered into the desert and the 40-day fasts of Moses and Elijah which was found in Exodus and Deuteronomy. 
As said before, the, the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. And before he could meet the public, he had to pray. He had to fast. And he had to be tempted by Satan. Angels, both holy and fallen, were ministering to him. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but I remember watching Passion, The Passion of the Christ in the movie, movie theater. And I will tell you what, that was the first time that I came out of a movie theater crying. Satan said, after, after seeing Jesus being led in the wilderness, and immediately after his baptism and being tempted by Satan, Jesus said, or Satan said, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Whereas Jesus replied in scripture, man does not live by bread alone. Satan then took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, saying that they were under the devil's control. He promised them to Jesus if he would fall and worship him. And Jesus replied with scripture, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And finally, his third temptation, Satan took Jesus to the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem and dared to throw himself off down. And once again, Jesus quoted from scripture, you shall not put the Lord, your God, to, to the test. The devil then left Jesus after seeing that he could not defeat him. Hallelujah. So what can we apply regarding the temptation of Jesus? We have the same adversary, the enemy, if you will. Jesus was tempted by the devil, and so are we. This is real. Have you ever noticed that when you are really, really right with God, everything is going your way spiritually? You know, you have that good feeling, and then bam! Here comes a temptation, stronger than ever. I notice that with me. I'm right with God. I'm right with God. I'm leaving church. I get into the car. And then, bam, here it comes. Here it comes. Jesus' temptations correspond to the temptations common to us. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and of course, the pride of life. Material food cannot satisfy. We need spiritual food from God's word. I've had close family members at the brinks of disaster because they got more than that they could handle. While we are to trust the Lord, we should not foolishly tempt him. Because he was fully human, Jesus is able to sympathize sympathize with our struggles and give us the exact, the exact help we need to resist temptation. To identify fully with human beings, Jesus had to endure Satan's temptations. We need to look to Jesus as our high priest when we need to approach him in prayer and reserve and receive mercy and grace at those times that we succumb to temptations. And finally, the third part of this morning's gospel has to do with the start of Jesus' ministry. Verses 14 to 15 mentions that Jesus went to Galilee to preach the good news after John was arrested by Herod. Jesus said, At last the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Turn from your sins and believe the good news. Jesus' public ministry involved preaching. And another word for preaching is to proclaim. We read that Jesus preached, Jesus proclaimed the, the, that the kingdom of God. According to 2 Daniel, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, but it's going to stand forever. For us now, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, for God rules the hearts of men. In the future, the kingdom of God will be the coming of the Lord. A new heaven and a new earth open will be experienced by those in the church who submits to God's will, who are believers, who believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But Jesus did more than just to announce the coming of the kingdom of God. He called on people to repent. He called on people to believe. To close, are we in the kingdom of God today? And do we submit to the rule of God manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. The good news of the kingdom is both now and coming. Thanks be to God and all of God's children says, Amen. Friends, I hope everyone has a great week, great start of the week. 
Uh, last week I said stay warm. Temperatures are, are it feels like a heat wave's out there. But I uh, stay safe and go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.